into chapter 4. Paul says, what I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So Paul slightly changes the portrayal here. In the previous verses, his point was that we became sons and who will inherit through Jesus Christ. And now Paul is expanding that picture a little bit. In the Roman law, adulthood was at 14 years old. So a 14-year-old son could inherit. But until the age of 25, he would have guardians and trustees assisting him. But until 25 years old, he would have guardians and trustees to assist him, to guide him, and to watch over him because he wasn't considered able to really take care of the estate and take care of himself. Now, the father, in his will, could adjust that age. And we have historical examples of fathers in their will saying, I want my son to be free of his trustees and guardians at the age of 20. And so he is given the full inheritance at the age of 20. But Paul is saying here that before we came of age, before we inherited, we were children under the basic principles of the world, he says. What does that mean? Well, the word that is translated there means to march in order. Uh, you could think of it as having a schedule, a regiment that you followed, is the idea. So the word means a schedule, and he seems to be referring here not only to the traditions of Judaism, but he is referring to that, because he says a little bit later, he says, you don't want to be enslaved to those things all over again, like observing special days, months, seasons, and years. But he probably also has in mind any kind of effort or religion to justify ourselves. So anything other than Christ that you depend on or rely on, some kind of structure or order that you think is going to make you right with God. And Paul says that we were slaves to that. So the idea seems to be that when we were still children, not sons who have received their inheritance, we were controlled either by the traditions and demands of Judaism or some other system or plan for being good enough. Before you came to Christ, what did you depend on to get you to heaven? Well, we have something that we hold on to, something that we put our trust in that's going to get us there. Okay? And what... And if you're going to put your faith and confidence in that, whatever that is, you become a slave to that, right? You become a slave to that. So he says here, uh, what we trusted in was either probably informed by religion, some of you said your church, your Christian parents, or whatever, or there was some other philosophy or system of thought, but we all tried to live up to some standard some standard that we thought would make us good enough. And Paul says here, when the time had fully come, God sent his son. What do you think made the timing of Jesus' birth perfect? One of the things that made the timing of Jesus' birth perfect was the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. Okay, And because of the Pax Romana, there was one common language throughout the world, Greek. Because of the peace of Rome, so much of the world had been conquered that there were good roads so that 
travel could happen easily so the gospel could spread. All right? And there was Pax, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. There was stability because of the military of Rome. And so there was free travel. You could, you could easily travel throughout the known world. Also, uh, at the time Jesus was born, the Jews had established synagogues throughout the known world. Okay? What was, what was Paul's practice when he first took the gospel to a town or a village? Went to the synagogue first, right? First to the Jews, then to the Greeks, then to the Romans, right? And so he would go and he would declare Jesus to people who had a background. And so often when you read the book of Acts, what does it say? That there were some people who believed. In that, out, of, out of that synagogue, there were some who came to faith in Christ. And all of a sudden you have a nucleus or a kernel of believers there in that town or in that city. Also, uh, the Jews had already translated the Old Testament into Greek. The Septuagint, most think it was probably uh, completed around 200, 250 before Christ. So you had all of those things in place that made the birth of Jesus and the gospel easily spread. It could go out. So God sent Jesus at the perfect time, at the first opportunity, Paul says, to redeem, what does that word mean, redeem? To buy, to purchase, yes. To redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons, he says. So we were slaves, he says, we were in slavery under these basic principles of the world. And God sent his son under law to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Why was it necessary for Jesus to be born into our same slavery? And he had to go into it in order to buy us out of it. And Paul says here, he says, because you are sons, this is verse, chapter 4, verse 6, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Uh, what do you know about that word, Abba? Yeah, a term of endearment. It's like daddy. And so, because we are sons, God has sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, and that gives us intimacy with God. And he says, God has made you also an heir. An heir. 